my shorthand is to, to make money, you got to spend money. You got to invest a little bit if you want to solve certain pain points and, and go bigger in different directions. And I know that you've put a lot of yourself into it. You are in front of the camera. But if we try and make it look like a business, what does that look like in a mature way? And I, I don't want to own their Instagram. I don't want to own their name on a profile. And that's why I advocate for, for brand building. Welcome to the Creator COO the show where we surface the operators behind your favorite content and creators. I'm your host, Matt Estes. Today's conversation is with Josh Kaplan, the co-founder and CEO of Smooth Media. Josh works with big creators like Colin and Samir, Matt Wolf, Hannah Williams, and Miss Excel. He's generated over $5 million for his creator clients, and he's bootstrapped his way to a seven-figure business. In this episode, we explore why creators need creator COOs, we discuss how to go about finding, hiring, and compensating an operational business partner. And we talk about the personality traits and skill set differences between creators and operators, including some of the most common points of conflict between the two parties. So with that, I bring you Josh Kaplan. Let's dive in. Well, Josh, thanks for being here. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Matt. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. We've got a lot of topics to talk about and... Uh, I know we're circling around a lot of the same things, so I figured uh, let's just let's just dive right into it. What's um, what's your founder story? How did you how did you get started with with Smooth Media? My my founder story dates back probably to like 2017, 2018, when I was at the University of Michigan, and Austin Reef and Alex Lieberman were picking up a lot of steam with Morning Brew, and I just as a friend was very interested and was continuing to ask questions. How are you growing it? How are you doing this? How are you doing that? Picked up a little work on the side the summer before my full-time job started and very much enjoyed that work a lot more than my big four consulting. It was a PwC consulting job within the accounting firm. And I was like, this isn't that exciting to me. This morning brew thing seems to be very, very as, as a guy interesting and forward making, looking. As yeah. a guy who did investment banking right out of college, I can completely relate to everything you just said. Right. I was traveling a lot, didn't fit in very well, but I had all that time on the airplane between uh, site visits to do some side morning brew work and just learn about the space and be more interested. So you fast forward a year, morning brew is hitting another inflection point. And Austin and Alex brought me on as just like another hand on deck where I ended up launching all the new products that were released while I was there, doing onboarding processes, just helping with different parts of a growing business that gave me a very wide array of experiences into startups and media and creators and how fast this pace is, this place, this industry has been moving to the point where when a company, right. I was strategy and operations for a point. I was product manager for a point. I was, I basically learned early enough where you, you do all the things that are important. It was a weird, yeah. I think Alex used to call me like the Swiss army knife. And I was like, that works for me. And then my job kind of shifted every couple of months where we would launch the new products, hire people. I would get us into podcasting and focused on that for a a good amount of time. And, And so to that point, just got a really wide experience worked with a lot of different people in the business, learned about the advertising side of things, the content creation. So you fast forward to Morning Brew getting bought by Business Insider. And I, I'm looking around and going, as far as what I had just done for two and a half years, this is a pretty big business. This is 75, 80 people We're in the middle of the pandemic. It seems like a good time to jump off and go try something new and go explore what else is beyond. Sure. And I, I had been meeting a lot of creators as we had gotten bigger and taking note of how much potential I thought that they had. And so really I quit without much of a sense of what I wanted to do next and started very fortunately consulting for Colin and Samir, who hopefully a lot of listeners recognize from what they've done in the creator economy as How did you meet those guys? How did you start with Colin and Samir? So it's it's very funny that Alex Lieberman, again, was, was very kind to me on my way out and introduced me to Samir because Samir was looking for advice from different people about whether or not to go niche to the creator segment. And Alex, throughout us working together, would always pass on some of those introductions because he didn't have the time to talk to everybody and pass me along to Samir. So Samir, Colin, and I hop on a call. We just had a good time. We were just talking about the direction in which media was going and, and how these things get done. And I think we got to a certain point, one or two conversations in where I think Samir goes, it seems like you've got time on your hands 
should we, you know, do you want to start consulting for us? And it's like, yeah, this, this seems like a pretty good thing. Let's give it a shot. So they're, they're both obviously very creative, but they're also very business savvy. Was there anything, was there anything about your interaction together that, um, you know, where you, you, you generated the credibility with, with Colin Samir that they would, they would trust you to be this, you know, creator operator type person and working with them. Yeah. And, and I don't know if this was advisable, but, uh, they had a, a very large deal offered to them from a potential advertiser very early into us working together and in, in almost in an or, informal way. And it, they had been on YouTube for about a decade and had found little success points here and there, but nothing truly breakthrough and consistent. And, and we're always the best storytellers, amazing producers, but hadn't really hit that breakthrough moment. And uh, I said, don't take the deal. We've got other things that you should be doing. You told me yourself that these were the things you want to do. And that doesn't fully align with selling most of your time and most of your headspace to this other brand. And I think that that type of idea of saying, say no to the short-term money really perked their ears. And they they trusted that decision. They made that decision on their own, but with, with my input. And And I think it also just solidified uh, the operation that I was putting forward. I wasn't telling them to create videos differently. I was talking about consistency and teaming and advertising rates and fill rates and sure. was able to just get in there and roll up my sleeves and get a couple of those things done. And a couple of weeks later, we started to really pick up momentum and, and they've continued to crush it since. So you kind of, you, you went from Morning Brew, started working with Colin Samir and then um, published press, obviously, followed that. And I would, I would bet that most of the people who would listen to this, this podcast probably also subscribe to Publish Press. I don't think that's a, a huge leap. <laughs> um, if not, go subscribe to the Publish Press newsletter. Go subscribe. It's that's great my content. first plug. <laughs> so how did you get from Colin Samir and Publish Press to something like Smooth Media? And, and what, is, what is Smooth Media exactly? Yeah. So over those first, call it six months of consulting with Colin and Samir and working a little bit with a couple other creator groups, I, I was starting to figure out, you know, could I make this replicable? Could I scale this beyond myself? I, I didn't really have the aspiration to just be a consultant. And I, I remember also over those six months trying to bring over Kinsey and Jenny back to working with me because I loved working with them. At Morning Brew, Kinsey was the second newsletter writer, the first podcast host. Jenny was the head of growth. And so much of the success that I was able to achieve at Morning Brew was very much because of them and other amazing parts of the Morning Brew team. But we were starting to fan out. Tyler Dank has gone on to build Beehive. And sure. I'm, I, I just got really excited. You got by this, the this little Morning Brew, Morning Brew Mafia is, is, right, uh, which, which, is growing. Yeah, and we all continue to stay in touch and people are doing really well. And uh, Jenny and Kinsey, I almost forgot at a certain point that I was trying to persuade them to come work with me, but they both ended up somehow being convinced to say, hey, there's a really big opportunity to uh, replicate what I've been able to do with Colin and Samir with other very high potential creators and build a build a portfolio of these creator partners and, and see where that goes because we find the space to be so promising. And so I'd say about August, so if I quit Morning Brew in that December, the following August, we really launched Smooth Media in earnest to provide more of these types of services to creators. And, and that's what we've been doing through Smooth Media for the past two, two and a half years. Is Smooth Media, is, is Smooth Media a media company? Is it a, is it a tech company? Is it an agency? Does the distinction matter or not matter? <laughs> uh, d depends who we're talking to, but it, it's, it's forming in a way where today we are an agency in the sense that we provide different services to a set of creator partners across content services, brand partnerships, operations, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. Mm -hmm. And the part of the grand vision is going from an agency to more of a platform where we can help incubate more brands like Publish to a, in, in a very strong way where we have trained team and trained services and different things sure. at scale like advertising to be able to launch brands a lot faster and at a much higher quality. So I think for a while we were trying to build brands and launch services and build a team all at the yeah. same time. And 
like I feel like most entrepreneurs would say, some things just take a little bit longer than you expected when you put it up on the whiteboard. So 2023 was really building the agency team and making sure we could be profitable. We've been bootstrapped. And next year, I hope that we can continue to grow more into having a platform and a growing portfolio of brands that we we have a lot of upside in. But so however you want to define like there's, there's the business today. There's, there's, yeah. there's We're not a technology company. company. That's what we Not do. a technology, yeah, but a, media, right. media agency. Is there something, what's the, I'm, I'm just trying to think, how do you distinguish between the two? Is it, is it like, um, is it economic model? Is it like, um, so I, I watched I the, so. the, the podcast that you did with, with Megan Lightclap, Lightcap and, and Slow Ventures. And one of the things that you, you guys talked about on that podcast was, um, how the like, different economic models make sense. Mm -hmm. for like business and operations help for creators. So on, maybe on, the, on the agency side, maybe you, you know, you, I don't know, you built bill per hour or something. The media side, maybe you have a, an ownership stake or a revenue share. Is that the, is that how you distinguish? Or is there something else? That, that's how I always distinguish uh, an agency. But we take a couple inspiration points from other companies and other formats where Industry Dive is a media company with fantastic, presence in different niche areas. Mm. Condé Nast also has a portfolio of brands like a Hearst or a Meredith or a Bustle Group. And these are very successful, predominantly New York or East Coast based media companies that own their brands and have relationships with editorial talent that I think a lot of those companies have, have learned from, which is a whole nother macro conversation about how media and creators converge. But then I also think about a, a private equity company that is able to buy different assets, improve them, sure. staff them differently. And for us looking at like media assets, how can we be like that private equity platform, which again, goes back to like what the, the Condé team does relative to like a Vogue team. Sure. Um, so again, so I'm throwing a, in a, a lot of a different holding company for, for multiple brands and equity ownership. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's what we're, we're hoping to develop over time. But really, if we're talking in today's context, we have most of that transactional relationships where for, a commission or for a flat fee or for an hourly, we're able to provide services, uh, build more reputation in the space, get better at what we're doing, understand the space as, as just a whole better so that when we are ready to make those more committed bets into different areas and opportunities, we, we have everything at our fingertips. So you, met, you mentioned earlier that, um, so you, you launched this, uh, this, this agency business this year that, um, I think you call it fractional COO services. Maybe there's some other, is that, is that what you, is that how you refer to it? Yes, exactly. I, I saw your press release from maybe five, six months ago and it said, uh, uh, and you made fun of yourself for using the word fractional as like a business jargon consulting term from a, from an ex consultant. <laughs> uh, but could, could you explain, maybe like break that down. What is, what's fractional, what's COO? What's it about? Definitely. We were working with and observing a lot of other creators that were growing to have multiple products, we're having multiple employees, contractors, different vendor relationships, and it becomes a lot to manage. I think manage is really like the key word is to manage and execute, where creators, not every single creator, and I think one thing that I'll, I'll always give the caveat is that there are a lot of different types of creators. Um, mm. But a lot of creators that we met don't want to manage everybody, is that they'd rather focus more on being flexible, being creative, getting to focus on their next episode, their next story. That's really why they got into this, not to manage five, six, seven people. So if we could offer in, in starting off with a bespoke service where we help hire that team, we help manage that team, it might be something as nuanced as running payroll and keeping up with the invoicing for contract contractors. Um, or saying, hey, we're going to send a start of week meeting to say this is what's going on in the world of this, of this creator this week and here are objectives. Because that just type of pacing, I think, gives the creator a lot of peace of mind to know that what they're working on is ultimately getting toward their larger vision sure. without having to do all the maintenance, which is is very, very important. Like my, we keep mentioning our, our original backgrounds and like from consulting, I did a lot of project management. And, and so I think that that just is so important. A lot of these teams are remote. A lot of different activities are happening and communication between agents and advertisers and editors and thumbnail designers. And just to keep all of that glued together yeah. requires somebody who has that wherewithal. And, and so we, we, A, think that we're quite good at it. And 
B, want to be able to make sure more people have it. Yeah. I see, I see this a lot talking to YouTubers and, and creators more broadly that there's, it's almost like there's, at first you can sort of break creators into one or two buckets. There's, there's a creators who can do the operational and business work and then some creators that quite frankly can't, it's just not their skill set. And then within that bucket of people who can do it, there's lots of reasons why maybe you wouldn't want to, or you, or you shouldn't do it. Like it's suboptimal for the business. And so then in both cases, I, I see tons of opportunity for entrepreneurs, you know, business savvy folks or what, what we call the creator COO or the creator operator to, to, to get involved and, and help grow the business. I, I completely agree. And I think that's going to be one of the most important growth moments for creators that want to build really large. And, and I don't know if that has to be the aspiration for every creator, but now as more opportunities are coming forth, uh, I think it's exciting to think big and to think about how you can impact an audience in a beneficial way. And to do that, you need a team, just like any startup. Yeah. You, 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 know, you don't need a gajillion people like a big tech company, but to have a couple people that are specialists in different roles working together is the recipe for, for success. But what was your tagline? And creators need business. Creators are businesses and businesses need operators or something like that. I think that was it. That was one of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, I'm certainly seeing a lot more, well, some creators want to, some creators want to build big businesses. Some creators don't, they have different aspirations, which is fine. They want to build, um, meaningful lifestyle businesses, but either way, um, I certainly see either one of those paths that you take. There's a lot more sophistication and like operational complexity that enters, that enters the, the day-to-day -day realm. And uh, I don't think it's unreasonable that you need help and that you need to, that you want to build a team the right way around that to solve those problems. And I think like the beautiful part about where we're entering into is like a lot of the creator tech hype has gone down a little bit. A lot of great tools the have been the tourists built, are, screen uh, included. The creator economy tourists are gone. Right. And, and a lot yeah. of great stuff has been built that makes things easier. And so now you just have more optionality that there's nothing wrong. It, it, there's actually a lot of things right about having a fantastic editor, a fantastic agent and running like that for years and being able to do super well, because that's what matches your ambition and your creative style. And then there's also a lot right about having everything in-house with a five person team and sure. a little office nearby to where you live and really enjoying to go in and, and work with the people that you decided to spend a lot of time with. So there's, there's plenty in between with smooth included and, uh, I think that's going to be like the beautiful part of this next part of the creator economy to see all the different types of teams and businesses that are created now. So you doing what you do, you must talk to tons of creators every week. Um, and with that, I imagine comes some pattern recognition. So when you're talking to creators, are, are there any like really obvious inflection points? Is there anything that you can identify consistently where you might say, yeah, you should you should maybe consider bringing on a a creator COO, a creator operator. Yes, there's, and I'll borrow another term from Colin and Smear and a lot of the vocabulary that they've donated to our space is finding a, a true content market fit is that when a creator really clicks with the platform, the audience themselves, you can see it that like there is really strong engagement. There's really strong growth. It doesn't feel so hard. And it's a little overwhelming. It's a little like perplexing at first. And we work with people who are very excited, but there's a lot going on. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of opportunities. And that's really obvious. I always say like, these are good problems to have, but like, we like to solve good problems. That's a fun part to understand how to capture all the momentum. And, and some people are before that part of the curve, which just means they're before it. And hopefully they'll continue to strive to get there and interface with different tools and, and, people that might be able to help educate them to get them that far. But before and after content market fit is a really clear signal. And then I think mm -hmm. also understanding how entrepreneurial that creator might be, because again, you know, it, this is a creative field. Not everybody is fully driven by the, the desire to make something large that makes a ton of commercial value and just recognizing that and being real with it for just the moment that they're in, maybe later on they change their mind one way or another, but understanding what the ambition is to do with all of that potential 
is uh, is a, a, a good, another fun conversation to have early on just to, sure. to be real about well, co- what content people are market to work fit, on. goals and aspirations. So I ma- imagine you, yeah. maybe you can diagnose content market fit from the outside, but then you probably have to have a conversation with the creator and like really dig in, do some discovery and, and uh, figure out what they want out of the business commercially. Right. As you put it. And, and I think part of the, part of being an operator is being, being an entrepreneur is seeing opportunity, seeing large opportunity that doesn't exist yet. And bringing forth ideas specific to that creator can also be a, a, a great game to play. And you just can brainstorm a little bit and say, you know, what do you know about the audience that other people don't? Because yeah. creators get this front row seat, they get all the DMs, people are giving them so much information and perspective, and they know what works and what doesn't. And that that's a really interesting starting point for, for business discussions. So I I have similar conversations with with big creators, particularly Uber, YouTubers, pretty frequently, and I can't I can tell I can't tell you the number of YouTubers with like a million plus subs that I've talked to who have clear content market fit, but they're hesitant to bring on a to build a team for for any number of reasons. And one of the one of the reasons that comes up quite a bit is is um, like cost and overhead. So. I get this pushback sometimes in conversations when I make this recommendation, right? It's, well, you know, things are going really good. I'm making good AdSense revenue. I've got this like other revenue stream on the side, but I like that I have a lot of flexibility. Oh, but I also have these big dreams too. Uh, but I like, I like that I have this, I like that I have this like cash flow flexibility. And uh, if things were to go wrong, right, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to cut a bunch of, of overhead, whatever it is. Um, what would you say to people like that, that, that bring up that objection? Well, I, I want to hear your answer first because I, <laughs> I'm curious what you've been saying. Yeah, so I, um, as a CEO myself, and a past investor who thinks a lot about where to invest the next dollar to get the return, I, I tend to think in terms of like investment forecasts. Forecasts are really just quantified goals if you if you think about it, and the relationship between the two, and. Um, my advice is normally to um, sit down, you know, think about what you can afford, think about your budget, your investment, think about where you want to go over the next one to two years, and then just you know be methodical about it. And um, the other piece of advice I often give is there's, you know, at least with some of the creator operators, the creator COOs, the business managers that I've been working with in the last, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, there are different economic models so, um, you know, if, if you, if you have lots of cash and really, really big dreams, you could just go out and hire a, a full-time creator COO, somebody, you know, an expensive executive, you could, you could do that. Um, maybe you're not ready to make that commitment. You don't have the cash, whatever the, the reason is, you can go the fractional COO route. Maybe you pay like a, a monthly retainer or a quarterly retainer, or something to that effect. And then, um, but there's lots of other, you know, if you want to, if you want to, um, you know, if you're a creator and you want to guard your cash, you know, there's people that will operate with revenue share models or um, do what people do in tech, which is, you know, maybe you, maybe you pay a salary or a consulting fee and you give a little bit of equity. That's one thing I, I don't, I feel like I don't see enough creators doing, but I think there it might be a knowledge gap issue or like a comfort issue with some of those like compensation constructs. Maybe it's a lack of understanding of like enterprise value, creation, equity value. Um, so that, that's typically the the advice I give, and sometimes it's received. I like it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to your first point, I my shorthand is to to make money, you got to spend money, which sure I feel like it just sounds easy to say. Like you got to invest a little bit if you want to solve certain pain points and, and go bigger in different directions, and I. Um, what I, what I try and do with a lot of creators is objectify the business and say, like, I know it might have your name on it. I know that you've put a lot of yourself into it. You are in front of the camera in these cases. But if we try and make it look like a business, what does that business really look like? And then what does that look like in a mature way? And sometimes I mean, just like sending over different business articles and business books to be like, I think you might really like this podcast and to just provide more of that business context because while I spend a lot of my time consuming business content, that doesn't mean that the person that I'm trying to work with does as well because sure. they're, they're doing other stuff. And that's the, the beauty of, of different skill sets 
within these types of conversations. And, and I think that also helps with the equity side of it to say, people don't want to give ownership of themselves to somebody else, which I understand. I don't want which, which somebody a, owning. It's a particularly unique and tricky problem to solve, I think, in the creator world, right? Agreed. Agreed. And, not, and not I don't only want do to creators, own that. Creators may not want to give the equity, but also if you're a venture, if you're a venture fund or let's say you're a creator operator, someone who sees a new stepping in, do you want that equity anyway? I think it's a trap. I don't want that. Yeah. I, I don't want to own their Instagram. I don't want to own their name on a profile. And that's why I advocate for for brand building. And that's that's what was what we were able to do with Colin and Smear and, and building Publish Press is I get to focus my energy on building Publish and saying together, let's build a brand that we can sell for a ton of enterprise value that we can bring on other investors and have teammates who are compensated. And like that is a tried and true scalable model of business building that a ton of people have perfected. And I don't, I don't see a great way to, to have that ownership. And I, I don't want it to be transactional. I want to have a lot sure. of it. And it's taken us time to figure out better, better ways to implement these types of things where we're becoming better and great at it, especially compared to our early selves. But the, these types of things are, are what's fun to talk about and try and figure out. And, and hopefully we can crack a really good way of messaging it and structuring it where it becomes very repeatable. But this is, this is hopefully the, the time that we're living in to figure it out. I would love to, um, I would love to explore that, that personality led approach sort of evolution to brand led with you in a second. But I want to go back really quickly to something that you said earlier, maybe explore a different or one of the earlier topics a bit more. And that is, um, so I'll give you another hypothetical kind of like I did earlier. So let's say that you're a creator, you've got content market fit, you have really big dreams. So you're on, you're on the side of the spectrum where you've got big aspirations and you want to build a, you know, uh, I'll make it as big as I can, a billion dollar enterprise value business. You're looking for your creator COO, your, I don't know, your COO co-founder. I don't know exactly what, you know, I don't, I don't know. We've like solidified the, the phrasing there yet, but, um, how would you recommend to that creator to go about finding a creator COO and also compensating them in a way that aligns them to the outcome that you're hoping to drive? And is there anybody in the market that you've seen do this and do it well in a way that makes sense to you? I've seen a number of different creators put out posts that are like, I'm really excited. I'm ready to bring on a CEO or I'm ready to bring on a partner of some kind. And a lot of people are commenting and engaging. And I actually think that's a pretty good way. You're, you're hiring somebody, you've started something. And whether you're hiring a co-founder partner or whether you're hiring an employee, you got to put up some sort of job posting and socialize the fact that you're looking for help and that there is a vision and that there's some maturity to what you're looking for. Um, I've also seen it outside of the creator world where people are like, I'm looking for a co-founder to help me build this piece of technology. And then you do an interview process. And I think it, the step one is knowing what you're hiring for. And are you looking for somebody who's done it before, who's more senior than you? Or are you looking for another person who hasn't really proven themselves and you're both hungry and in that early part of your career, ready to put a ton into it? Or are you a couple of years in and you want somebody young who can just like put in a ton of work that might be happy to like be more of an employee. So I think understanding like that or, hierarchy or any pattern recognition recognition there. Like, uh, uh, I don't think that, I have pattern recognition on that. I don't have enough like true data points to be like, this is the right, you know, someone who's done it before the you're equal. I think there's like a, I think it's already hard enough finding somebody who you want to work that hard with every day. And so it's more yeah. so like if you find somebody that really understands what you're going for, that you enjoy, that you are like, this person's smart. This person's really got it going on. They bring something new to the table. Then I'm like, figure out how to get them on board and, and see how it I goes. Do, it's, it's hard to find. I do good see a lot of parallels in this conversation to a conversation I think that happens a lot more in tech in the startup world, which is the, the, the technical co-founder versus the non-technical co-founder. And you have, you have all these technical co-founders that are looking for a business co-founder and, and, and vice versa. And there's a lot of, you know, if you just Google this problem, you'll find dozens of blogs and articles helping people through the process. But there's nobody really doing that yet, I think, for the, you know, the creator versus the creator COO. 
I I tend to agree, and I, I think it's a good parallel. I think there's a lot of similarities, and then there's one really one I don't know one or two whatever. But there's really one thing that comes to mind that's really different is that in a technical and a non technical partnership, both can really try and replace themselves and and rise up and free their time to be more strategic and think freely and raise money and hire people. And in a creator and an operational duo, the creator still has to show up every day and put up content. And and there it feels a little unfair sometimes because the role that I play is I'm going to keep trying to replace myself. I'm going to keep trying to hire better people that can do the sub parts of my job where, hey, you can delegate editing and you can delegate production management, but you still got to go make the content because that's what you're really freaking good at. And it, we haven't figured out AI cloning perfectly yet, nor do I, I don't know, whatever, this whole separate conversation. But, um, yeah, it's a good, but I think it's a recognizing good that there's something unfair about that is, is really important just to be honest in the conversation and understand where both people get leverage over time and to say, hey, Josh and Matt, we're going to do it together, but Josh is the creator. In five years, let's try and make this a certain size. And in years four and five, I want to hire other creative talent so I can be less necessary, not unnecessary, but less less day-to-day necessary and are you and i on the same page that that's part of the roadmap yeah and i think that's all a a matter of constructing a a vision and and how these companies get built because if we're going to try and get a great exit like so many tech founders do once again i can't sell myself (laughs) i don't don't want to sell josh for a million years i want to sell something that can stand without me so some of this i think agreed is like a level of sophistication but it's it's getting this is something i've heard you talk a little bit about in the past and in part i imagine it's because you've done it yourself with publish press and some of the other um, media properties that you've built but you've i've heard you advocate in the past that you if you're if you're let's say you're equity incentivizing somebody or revenue share incentivizing a let's say you're a creator and you're looking to incentivize an operating partner the way i think you would advocate to do it is you you create a business you create an llc or a c corp that's like specifically tied to, I don't know if this is the right examples, but like a courses business or a newsletter or something else. So it's, how do you, how do you think through that? I mean, it's like sort of the creators contributing their brand and their name. So they're contributing that into the LLC. Then like, walk me through, walk me through your, your reasoning and, and why you advocate for that. I advocated again to objectify the business in a good way to be like, Hey, like we're building something together. Like we need to make objective decisions that um, we can talk about in a clear way. So right. For like a, a Cody Sanchez of contrarian thinking or a Matt Diavella with slow growth. I like having these duos where you have the name and then the brand and hopefully the brand can continue to grow over time that it has a dedicated team and a dedicated ability. And that's not to say that the, personal creators cannot have a great team that does get bonuses that is very productive and fulfilling, but there's no real, I I don't see that as like the exit opportunity where I personally want to be able to build brands that will last 10, 15, 20 years and have the optionality to do all sorts of things. And so that, that I think is a a separate conversation. And so when the creator makes that partnership, just just to stop you there real quick, I think I might've articulated it wrong. So I think, I think what I said was you you set up this business for a you set up a LLC for a courses business or a newsletter business and that's not what you're saying what you're yeah, actually yeah. saying is you've got Colin and Samir but you set up this business that's published press and that's sort of the brand umbrella or you set up this business that's contrarian thinking which is Cody Sanchez's brand umbrella right and, and if they want to do things outside of that and of course it, it comes down to a matter of respect and things like that but hey I don't, I don't you know I get to do other things the creator gets to do but yeah I want to say hey we're committing to this business. And we're really going to take it seriously. We've got responsibilities. And for something like the creator, you might say the company gets a in perpetuity license to the NIL of the creator that is con- that is a, the partner on this business. And then it gets unwound upon exit or upon change in majority ownership. So part of you going to sell the business would be to say, hey, you, you're no longer going to get unlimited use of the Colin and Samir likeness after mm. this acquisition and we, we haven't gotten that far this is all hypothetical <laughs> this is all these, these aren't terms that you're necessarily seeing routinely in contracts but they're terms that you might hypothetically i'm suggest. trying to experiment with them right okay. to say hey if we're going to create this jv and we're going to be the the 
collaborative owners on this thing. I agree that at the end of the day, if we sell it to another media holding company, that they're not going to get to just use the talent's name willy nilly. Like that doesn't seem fair. I don't. I don't want them to be able to do that. I want to be incentivized to build a business that can stand without that. But they're this amazing accelerant to getting us off the ground and getting us all the way through to that point. So th- these things, I think, are, are just what I like yeah. to experiment with in the conversations that we have, and I'm sure other people listening or you might have other great terms, but like as an industry, if we can get better at figuring out what these templates look like, then again, we'll all get to go faster. And so you would juxtapose there's, there's personality and then there's brand. And so this, this makes me think of, um, and this is a conversation that comes up, I think a lot with, with YouTubers that I talk to who are growing, becoming more sophisticated and, and have big dreams. It's like, <clears throat> I'm worried if it's if it's just my face on this that I, it's going to be hard for me to sell it because there's lots of key man risk. Or I'm worried if it's just my face and it's just me creating content that I'm going to get burnt out or I'm already feeling burnt out. I want to get off the content hamster wheel. Um, so th- these are things I, I hear a lot. And um, I've got some folks that I work with directly that have, have done this well, like Chris Sharp and Adrian Mishler with the Find What Feels Good brand, you know, eight-figure annual revenue business. Um, or, uh, Justin Rhodes with abundance plus, you know, similar eight figure mm-hmm. business. Uh, and he's got his homesteading business in, uh, or his homestead, I should say in North Carolina, he started to incubate all of these homesteaders underneath his brand umbrella, That's all cool. local folks, Love that. really cool. Love that. Um, building a community simultaneously, awesome brand. Um, I've also seen I don't know, maybe some examples where this hasn't gone great or it's unclear if it's gone well. So like I think of um, like Dave Portnoy with Barstool. It's like, you, I think you could argue with both sides of that. You know, did, did is it really Barstool or is it really Dave Portnoy? Or um, another one that comes to mind is like Magnolia Network with Chip and Joanna Gaines. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that organization feels great about how well they've done sort of moving, moving beyond Chip and Joanna Gaines. Um, What's your direct experience been like doing this in real life? Do you have any and do you have any tips for creators or creator COOs who are going through the same process? <laughs> I well, we're, we're we're in the early innings of a lot of these, and, and at Morning Brew, I saw our, the, the beginning of growth into having talent and how a media company interacts with talent and empowers them. And, and you know, you look at like Call Her Daddy starting at Barstool and then growing out of it into her own thing. And for everything that we're doing, we we're still in that zero to one phase of, of like really great brand and business building. So I, I'm curious for more feedback about how, as we get bigger, we continue to just have fantastic business relative to the experiences that you've pointed out in the, the case studies. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I think we've just continued to learn on the fly and, and just try and do really good work and figure out ways to move things forward. And just even starting, it's like every niche is different. I think we're trying to narrow in on a particular playbook of businesses that we partner in in this like B2B media world, which is a whole nother topic as well, but one that we feel really comfortable with given the work we did at Morning Brew, launching Retail Brew and Marketing Brew and figuring out like that trade association, trade association 2.0. But if we can get that playbook done really well and figure out how to work with creators on that avenue, my hope is that other friends and peers of ours say, hey, oh, we can follow certain frameworks and apply it to different parts of a very large media digital entrepreneurship world. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I certainly don't have tips about like the exiting and the, the absolute maximum of these things. But I, I, you know, it's, hopefully it's, we'll get to do a podcast to like, like this in a couple of years. It, it sounds to me like if, if I were to summarize your, your points there that um, it's just so early. I, it, it, there's, just, as you said earlier, you know, another topic that there's, there's just not a lot of data points. So um, I guess we There's not a lot. Doing, some keep are doing it further ahead. You look points. at like Bill Simmons has done some really cool stuff, leveraging his likeness and his ability to great, build great editorial teams with Grantland and then The Ringer and selling that to mm. Spotify. Mythical with Red and Link, and they've got an amazing leadership team yeah. out on the West Coast. Um, they've been phenomenal with their growth. So there's the, more and more data points, and that's what's fun about operating published presses that we get to as part of our work track all these different developing stories 
Um, but yeah, to your point, I, I don't think, and you know, regardless of the contract or the framework, like some are going to succeed and some are going to fail. I feel like getting into startup land, I, I knew that the, the odds weren't exactly in everybody's favor. Yeah, you can you can you can set yourself up with the the most aligned incentives ever and the best contract terms, but the, at the end of the day, it's that helps. It's a good place to start, but your business is going to survive or fail based on the quality of your content and the people that you can hire and your distribution exactly. and all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I want to change the uh, if it's okay with you, Josh, change the direction of the conversation a little bit. Um, I love I love the macro stuff, uh, but I think. Um, Some feedback, some feedback that I've been hearing uh, more and more from from creators and creator so COOs is about some of the psychological differences between creators and creator COOs. And I'm not a psychologist, but I think you know pretty quickly if you interact with the two groups of people, you can you can tell that maybe on the on the creator side, you've got folks who are more creative, higher in openness, um, perhaps less conscientious. You know, over on the creator COO side, you're looking to hire somebody who can do things like manage payroll, uh, keep the lights on, whatever. Some of the more boring back office things. Not just that, but perhaps they're a bit more conscientious, yeah. orderly. Um, two very different personality types interacting very, very close day to day. Have you ever encountered friction or tension in relationships like that? Yeah, sure. Definitely. And, and I think this is like classic media business. Like, like this part actually isn't that new. And we've always talked about like how big the wall is between editorial and revenue. And mm -hmm. when a creator has a lot of skin in the game and ownership, I think that there's a lot, uh, it's a lot easier to keep that wall low and to keep things moving forward. But you sometimes mm -hmm. reach that part where advertiser X is ready to go six figure contract. This is huge. Let's go for it. Creator goes, I don't know if I like that brand. I don't know if they're like the right fit for what we're doing. And we've got a lot of other things going on. The, the business person goes, we'll figure it out. We'll hire people. We'll have cash. We'll have revenue right there. Like we'll figure it out. But the creator goes, I don't know. It's going to mess up the tempo. I, and, and so I, it usually that shows that there's tension and mm -hmm that there's other things that need to be discussed. You know, how did we sell this? Was it the right thing to even sell? Did we sell out of that particular type of inventory or like, was this the right campaign to pitch? And I think if you can settle those conversations amicably and be like, we're on the same team, we're trying to, you know, build this big vision. If revenue is good and we're focusing on something else, like let's, let's make sure we understand the true priorities of the business and make the right decision together. I mean, that's like anything, right? Like I'm sure even and, with a technical founder and a non-technical yeah, founder, there's friction another, as far yeah. as like how fast we could build a feature. But that that friction or that tension, I, I've heard about and I've experienced in all sorts of different scenarios. And I think the ability for the both sides of the business to like come together and push through it is what makes these things stronger and better um, in the long run. But it, it totally exists. And even like understanding schedules like creative people like to have open schedules and they should have open schedules to go hang out with other creative people and you know work when they feel like they work best where like me as a business person i'm like we've got working hours we've got meeting agendas we've got calendar like come on let's let's follow the process to a t so and, this and i had to loosen of, up I, I, yeah it took a this lot reminds of, me a lot of know, um, customization uh claire hughes johnson who was who was the coo at stripe for a long time and she's the She's the COO I want to be. She's the one I aspire to be every day, mm -hmm. although I'm, I'm falling short. But uh, she recognized very early when she joined Stripe that the, the, the two founders, the brothers, were super, you know, they're, they're developer types, engineers, very high in openness, very high in creativity. And um, Claire Hughes Johnson is, she's not that person. She's hyper orderly. She likes, she's got all her bullet pointed notes, her agenda for every meeting. She's, she's got times listed for every bullet point, right? She's driving through them. And, um, and she had to change up the way that, that she ran meetings and that she interacted with the, with the Collison brothers because of, because that personality dynamic. And, uh, I love that you brought it back to the, this idea of, um, you know, there's some differences between technical, non-technical co-founder analogy to creator, creator COO, but, Maybe there's another similarity there. 
uh, and then you point out it's not not really a new problem, right? So I think you're sort of making the point there that uh, I don't know me, digital media 1.0, like Vice Media and BuzzFeed. I guess you're saying there was a similar yeah. friction. I'm sure this goes way further back and, to like print of like how much space can the advertiser take up on a print page? I, like I, I have to imagine that those arguments. <clears throat> and I love what you're saying about uh, about Stripe because it's really interesting. And I feel like there's still so much to learn. And sometimes we make it feel like the creator world is so brand new. And uh, you know, talent agencies have been around for a very long time and media businesses and these tech, uh, technical and non-technical. And like there's still so much to learn from all these other areas that, uh, you know, as far as me feeling like a, a still early in my career business person, I'm like, yeah, like I want to learn from all of those history pieces, not just like what's right in front of us with the, the few data points that we have available. So if you're a, if you're a fractional CEO, creator COO or a full-time creator COO or business manager or creator manager, and you're starting to work with a creator, is there any advice that you would have, uh, for those folks going into the relationship, like how to accommodate maybe or collaborate better with the creative types? It's a good question. A uh, couple of different things come to mind. I think the first thing is like, like the word creator, I feel like it's just like still way too widely used. And it's like, who are you really working with? Like get to know that person. Like if you have this opportunity to go in on a creator endeavor and you are the COO counterpart, the operational counterpart, like understand what the relative skill sets are, like understand what people feel like their strongest suits are and understand the scheduling of it. And when should, how fast can we go? And um, I feel like really over communicating what people have as priorities is really helpful. And we're always like following the, uh, the Tao of the book, uh, Traction. I don't know if you've ever picked up that, that business book. No, and I haven't read it. Traction's a, a phenomenal like business process book about like goal setting and role development. And for like the COO types who might be listening, like flip through it, go pick up a coffee. Like, I don't know. I'm sure we should have affiliate links set up with this. But to Austin Reese's credit, years and years ago, he stumbled upon it. Somebody gave it to him and he made a lot of us at the company read it. And I think it really helped us just like have a framework for figuring exactly what you asked. And if that helps you get out your like operational compulsions and your, your bullet journals, like use it, adapt it to how you can, but get to know the creator, understand like what type of creator they are. That, that feels like the advice that I'd have to give as to somebody going yeah, into so it. And, your point there is, yeah. it makes sense. Your point is it, it's almost too general to say creator because it's, it, it, we're people, we're humans and we're so different, each one of us. And so you've, you've just got to get to know the person and then the person you know, and, and the, the creative out output is like, do they do a daily show? Or are they putting up multiple clips a day? Or are they working on a big project that goes up every four months? Like all of these things really do like impact both the personal level of the work and how you're going to set up the rest of op the operation around it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that stuff's super, super important for, for getting on there. And I, I think having like a really great, mission or through line is super important because some creators are incredible at engaging their audience and putting out interesting stories. But with the absence of a vision and some sort of mission, I feel like it's easy to just be creating content for the sake of creating content. Mm. And the sooner you can be like, I want to have an impact on X. I want to help my audience with Y it helps you and the other people in the room rally around that goal and figure out what are all the other ways we can help accomplish that because it's more of a shared thing. It's not just like, let's make Josh really popular. Um, so I, I feel like like defining some of those things early on and again, like letting them evolve as needed, but sure. having that type of thing that you could print out and, and put on a wall is, uh, is just like another, I feel like you need to rally around something in order to go really far. On the topic of going really far, I've got um, this point of view that I've expressed. To, I express pretty frequently, which is, uh, I believe very strongly that the the next billion dollar businesses are going to be creator or creator led businesses. I guess first question is: Do you agree with that? I agree. Yeah, yeah, I really do agree. Do you think? Um, is, are there any creators that you can think of right now um, or perhaps creators that you've worked with where 
you would put them in that category category of, you know, this could be a, a billion dollar creator business. And define that as roughly the way I kind of think about it is, you know, something around, you know, hundred million of recurring revenue, you know, 10 times, 10 times revenue multiple gets you to roughly a billion dollars. Anybody that you can think of that you would fit into that? Anybody, I, one, one of my favorite entrepreneurs is Kat Norton, who's Miss Excel. We work with her on her newsletter and she's just like very, I don't know, her business is amazing. Like she realized that Excel was being taught in a rather boring way, caught traction via TikTok through the pandemic and has learned and figured out so much about the course business for like one of the most widely used softwares on the planet. And the way that she's talking about going through the Microsoft suite and education at large and understanding how to do digital marketing, I'm like, this is amazing. Uh, so I think that's one really cool example, which I think what when we think take? about like the education market, yeah. I, I know this is this is a this is a big dream and it's a it's a very lofty aspiration, but what's missing in her business or or what would it take incrementally to get her to conceivably be a hundred million annual recurring revenue business. I don't even know what she's at now. So I don't even know the right answer as to how far away she might be off of that or how close she is to it. I, uh, my bet is that while Miss Excel, her face is fantastic. And I, I don't know. If she, I don't even know if she's working on this or not. My memory is, is fuzzy on the last conversation, but bringing on other people to represent it. Like how can you get other personalities or other ways to get distribution when you have this competency of making amazing interactive courses. And she's playing around with like AI production and, and mm -hmm. all sorts of really cool ways of making it so you can learn how to, how to do business computing, I guess would be Excel, the category, uh, or she's even doing like email tutorials, but sure. I, I think it's a matter of scale, right? Like it's a huge market. And then when we talk about like Mr. Beast with chocolate or like uh, the other example that I was going to bring up is like Kevin Espiritu with Epic Gardening who we're writing a right. story about with, with Publish right now like gardening is a huge industry like I don't know what the direction of like the yeah. hobby gardening space is but I just know it's really large and right. if these people can grow beyond themselves even though they might get to you know however many figures in revenue based off of their own likeness like which which I'm Kevin sure and Epic Kevin and Epic he Gardening has. are working on doing that right now. Yeah. Right. He's bringing on other hosts. It's called Epic Gardening. It's not called Kevin. Uh, and like, I'm sure Feastables will have, I mean, I don't know, because it's Mr. Beast, which is like such an insane example, but like, will he have to find other distribution and marketing points beyond Mr. Beast? Like, possibly, but like Hershey's is, what? Well, I don't know what their market cap is, but like, could he be the next Hershey's? I truly don't see why not. And that's probably like tens of billions of dollars, like 30 billion or something. I tried to check recently. I think you're, I think you're, you're, um, and you're sort of circling around something that to me is, to me has been the big question to answer that. So if, if the question is like, what does it take to go from where I don't really know where Kat Norton is, is today, but wherever she is right. to a hundred million of recurring revenue, I have a better answer. First, but yeah. One of the first questions I ask is, or I think about is, is it possible to do that with just like info products, you know, cause it's very clear, like in early stages, info products are such a great way to generate very cash flow positive revenue streams. Um, and then your two examples I thought were interesting. So Mr. Beast, obviously, he started to sort of vertically integrate businesses with Feastables. And I know Beast Burger didn't turn out super well, but but um, it was a thought that counted, right? There's sort of the, there's, there's a clear sort of trend and direction there. And then you look at someone like uh, what Kevin and Linus and, and Epic Gardening have done, uh, it's a huge, they, they recognize that this massive market, it feels like it's relatively underserved, digitally speaking. And they raised a bunch of money and they went out and they bought a seed company. You know, they, 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 um, they I think they've made three or four acquisitions at this point, but they've started to vertically integrate, uh, eat more of the value stack. Um, that's my sense. I think that's probably true. Um, and I, I'm starting to see more and more. I don't know if it's relevant to, you know, Miss Excel, but I'm starting to see more and more of these uh, creators who who primarily monetize through maybe info products previously. Now they're building SaaS products or they're building out services businesses or they're, uh, they're you know, they're, they're selling e-commerce. I love it. Yeah. 
I, I think it's great. And when we think about like the digital products, the info products, advertising, like the marginal cost is very limited. So it's fantastic cash flow if you can really figure it out, which you can reinvest into some of the stuff that's more capital intensive or you can raise money. So I, I think that we, we just hit on another area of sophistication that we're getting to, which is really great to see and like to understand as smarter financiers get into it, like, hey, like you can go acquire a company and bring it into your creative empire. Like that's a very realistic thing. Like I would love to get into that game with the people that we work with. But I, I think another big thing that needs to be discussed is the size of the actual macro opportunity. And I think if we're if we were in like a tech entrepreneurship podcast, we'd be like, so how big's the TAM? <laughs> and I like I don't think a lot of creators ask that question. Sure. Uh, or people look at their highest subscribe platform and go, what if you convert X percent, like your TAM is your subscriber base, but the world is much bigger than that. Like, uh, so, so I think finding and doing the research to find like, what, what does this audience actually need is what I keep coming back to is like, how do you align that creative ability, that audience presence, that fun that you're having with, oh my God, this is actually a great startup idea. Like this is a really, there's a need for innovation here. And I think to like the Mr. Beast thing, it's like, do we need another chocolate bar? Like is, you know, maybe it's better sourced or healthier and, and that's fantastic. But what creators are going to really change the way we interface with things, the way that Uber and Airbnb change the way we interface with, with certain things. And that's very grandiose. And those are venture capital backed ideas. And I don't think everything needs to be venture backed to that scale, but it's starting the conversation for, a meal or two and saying, where's the opportunity? Sure. Not, you know, what does the latest startup service uh, provide or offer? Yeah. And, and to your point about Feastables, uh, it does feel like, and it, credit to the creators who, who want to build big businesses and are going out of their comfort zone, doing CPG products, whatever it is. Um, to your point, there's, there's probably only so many really big creator branded CPG products that you can do. And, Maybe a you know maybe a Logan Paul KSI can slap their brand on something and sell a lot of it or you know same thing with with Mr Beast but that's probably not accessible to most creators to just slap maybe your brand like onto a, more, a relatively commoditized product. Maybe it's easier to physically create those brands like the Pietras of the world are being like we can have a lot more mid tier successful ones beyond Gatorade and Prime and I, I don't know I think that's okay right to to those people's credit it's a, it's a great way to make a living and, and push these things forward. But I, I really like the Miss Excel example because I think education is something a lot of people complain about being broken. The sure. college tuition being too expensive or there being certain education deserts. And if somebody has an internet connection and for free or for a smaller dollar amount and not a multi-year commitment and an admissions process, you can get access to amazing intellect. Like that's a huge thing that we can try and fix and creators that are brilliant can scale tremendously. So I don't know how much of like the macro, like our creator is going to save education feels like a pretty aggressive headline, but, um, but, but yeah, I think that there's just like so many places in the world that we can apply this, this type of thinking. Any other parting thoughts that you'd want to leave the the audience with either, either creators <laughs> or aspiring creator COOs that you think, uh, yeah. Any, any parting thoughts you want to leave folks with? I. Uh, that's a good, I, I really enjoy these conversations. These are super fun. So if anybody listening wants to reach out and have a conversation like this, I'm, I'm more than welcome to. I enjoy it. I would love to. And, and I think if uh, this is being listened to by creators, it's you know just try, consider growing your team and seeing what it's like to have that type of professional companionship. I think it could lead to a, a lot of great things. And if you're more on the operator side listening to this, DM your favorite creator and just say what's up and be like, hey, I, I feel like you've got a lot of opportunity. I wonder if I can help you in any way compliment their content, tell them why you actually like them. They get a lot of DMs, but it, it's just so easy to get in touch with people on the internet these days if you do it the right way. And I think it's it's opened up a lot of opportunity for us that I would not uh, want people it's to the power, the power of the yeah. Twitter DM or the LinkedIn DM. Yeah, it's, it's like the most powerful button on the internet. So I don't know, I'd, I would continue to encourage people to use it, but I, I really appreciate coming on. Like this is super, super fun. I'm, I'm honored to get to talk about these macro things and have a thoughtful conversation. Thanks for taking the time, Josh. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creator COO. 
If you found this valuable, you can subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Also, please consider giving us a rating and a review as this helps other creators and creator COOs like you to find the podcast. This episode was produced by Rebecca Donovan at Uscreen with support from the team at Share Your Genius. It was edited by Chandler Chapel with artwork design by Spencer Marsh. I'm Matt Estes, and you've been listening to The Creator COO. See you next time.